This is Epicenter, episode 407 with guest Mike Novogratz. Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Friederike Ernst, and I'm here with Brian Crane. Today, we're speaking with Mike Novogratz. Mike has been a Wall Street fixture for a while and has made and also lost several fortunes. His latest fortune he made with Bitcoin and Ethereum, and he's holding on to it. He currently serves as the CEO of Galaxy Digital, an investment bank targeting institutional investors that he also founded. And uh, with him, we talked about the crossover and merge between finance and blockchain, regulatory affairs, the market, and of course, also wrestling. So before we go to the interview, let me tell you about our sponsors. Are your crypto assets sitting idle in your wallet? Start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Course One, a staking provider securing over 2 billion US dollars worth of assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Interested in running your own branded nodes? The managed white label node as a service offering leverages Course One's highly available and proven infrastructure, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Head over now to Course.one to start your staking journey. I would also like to thank Paraswap. Paraswap is an easy-to-use DEX aggregator that beats the market price. It's fast and liquid, and it is now integrated natively with Ledger, allowing you to trade from the safety of your hardware wallet. Paraswap is also live on Polygon. Next on the roadmap is an integration with Chainlink Keeper to allow for the placement of limit orders off-chain. These orders will then be executed when the price conditions are met, bringing a much-missed CeFi feature to DeFi. So stay tuned. So we're here today with Mike Novogratz. Mike is, I remember actually hearing about Mike Novogratz in, I think 2013, when it was like, you know, Bitcoin was very much under the radar. And then there was this some, some famous banker guy who was like saying something about Bitcoin. And this was still a sort of a time when this was front page of Bitcoin Reddit, which was like the, the main source of the Bitcoin community back then. So I remember kind of hearing about him back then first time, but of course, since then, he's actually become like very involved in the crypto space uh, through his company, Galaxy Digital and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm really excited to, yeah, to have you on today, Mike. Yeah, it's amazing, amazing how eight years goes fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe start with wrestling. Like we heard you speak about wrestling in some other places. I'm wondering if you mind share a bit, like what's the impact that wrestling has had on you and on your life? So wrestling makes you tough. It is a, it's not a fun sport, right? You, you get the hell beat out of you. You exercise to the point of exhaustion. Actually, my wrestling coach from high school, uh, unfortunately just passed away this, this past week. And a bunch of us were, you know, online reminiscing. And I was like, he put us through practices that felt like we were in a gulag. I mean, we would have four hour practices where you would start with running miles and pushups, four hours in a heated wrestling room, I was like, that's probably torture. But through that hard work and toughness, right, and grit, you, you end up with a resilience uh, and a toughness. And so the rest of your life, you walk on your front foot, like you're just not scared. And it's great for risk taking because it's like, it can't hurt me that bad. You know, there's a great scene. Once you've wrestled, everything else in life is easy. I d done a lot of wrestling charity stuff because I realized there was this link between making kids disciplined and tough and leadership, right? 14 of the 44 presidents of the United States had wrestling in their background. Abe, Abe Lincoln, maybe our greatest president, used to go from town to town and wrestle for a living. Uh, back then, they called it catch as catch can. That, that's, that's what wrestling was called. Uh, but it was basically the same thing. And so you know, the guys that took down the plane over uh, Pennsylvania during 9-11, you know, the famous let's roll, both wrestlers, right? And so... It allows, it teaches kids, both men and women now, boys and girls, how to lean on their front foot and not be scared. And that's why I like wrestling. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a super interesting background to have, to have. And basically being resilient and getting up is kind of what characterizes you as a person. So next you went into banking, right? Well, yeah, I, I 
started Goldman Sachs right after the army. And, you know, I was a money market salesperson and money market sales is maybe the easiest job in an investment bank. You know, you're selling the simplest of products. Like it's 10 day, 30 day at, when you were going wacko, you'd go 90 day duration commercial paper uh, to very lovely people who ran money market funds. Uh, if you know fixed income, the further you're away from zero, the more risk there is, you know? So when you go very low duration, there's very low risk. Uh, and, and so it was a great way to get exposed to Wall Street because it wasn't an 80 hour week. It was show up early. You had to be at the office by like 6.30 or seven, but I was home by five o'clock. Uh, and as a young kid in New York, that was a, those, those were great hours. Uh, but learning the yield curve, learning how short interest rates affect all other asset prices is in some ways foundational for being an investor. And so in lots of ways, everybody should start in the money markets and then move their way out. And so I look back and I was like, wow, it was a pretty easy job, but it was a really important job. So when you like, what, what attracted you to finance back then? You know, the honest answer is I was attracted to politics and I went to Washington DC after I always thought I'd be a politician or working in that space. And I went to Washington DC after I finished flight school and, you know, I had no money. You didn't get paid a lot in the army. I didn't grow up with money. I owed my college roommate who was rich, a lot of money because I was always borrowing money from him. And in DC, the, the young people's jobs paid almost nothing. And, you know, a lot of the people that were getting them were sons and daughters of wealthier people who could get subsidized. Uh, and I remember I ran into a guy who had been the secretary of the army. And he said, son, let me give you some advice. He said, go to New York City and make some money. And when you're 40 and you've got something to add, then you should come back here. And so I, it was like insightful advice. I was like, okay. So I came up to New York and I lived on a friend's couch. I'd gone to Princeton. A lot of Princeton kids work on Wall Street. And so all my friends were working on Wall Street. And I lived on his couch for 90 days. And the, the deal was I could live for free as long as I came back with a good story every night to tell him. So I would have to do something silly. Uh, in that case, in that time of my life, it was probably, you know, approaching some beautiful girl or, or doing something silly that I could give him a story to keep my rent. And, you know, I ran into a friend who got me interviews at Goldman Sachs and 22 interviews later, I got a job. And so I, I, I came to Wall Street really because that's what my friends had done. Uh, and I wanted to make money. Uh, I fell in love with it because the part that I ended up migrating to, right, macro, macroeconomics, macro trading, is all about politics, policy, psychology. And so in some ways, you know, when I was, I remember being in Hong Kong with my team during the 97 crises and talking to someone uh, in the State Department, he was like, dude, you have better information about Indonesia than we do. Like, you know, we, we sit in the middle of this unbelievable information source. And so if you're a good macro trader, you, you know what's going on in Nigeria and you know what's going on in the UK politics. You know what's going on in the economies of India and China. And, and so I loved the widget. I always tell people, if you want to sell cars, you better love cars. If you want to work in macro, you better love politics and policy and economics. And so I love the widget. And crypto really fits so squarely in this, right? Crypto is macro. It's this giant idea uh, of, you know, that's got economic history. To forget the computer science, the computer science enables it, but what makes it work is macro, right? It's this economic idea that people want something different, that people don't trust governments, that generation, you know, the younger generations, right? Millennials, Gen Z, look up at baby boomers and say, F you that you've polluted the planet, right? The UN just had this report that, you know, we're 10 years away from complete instability. Who knows if they're right, but we know one thing, the planet's getting a lot hotter and there's a lot of bad weather happening. In America, the average weight of both men and women have gone up 30 pounds in 30 years. So if you think about baby boomers, right? Bill Clinton took office in 92. So from 92 till now, we've been ruled by the baby boomers, right? America's gotten fat, the country's gotten polluted, and we've blown the debt and deficit out to levels that are unsustainable. The rich-poor gap has gotten wider than it was before the French Revolution. 
And so there's an arrogance, a sheer arrogance, a complete lack of humility from our leadership, from Nancy Pelosi, from Joe Biden, Donald Trump, from Mitch McConnell, from all of these in older politicians, baby boomers, and, and even older than baby boomers, that, oh, they should still be in charge, right? Wait, wait, you haven't done such a good job. Maybe you should have some humility to say, huh, maybe there's some other ideas. And so when Richard Shelby vetoed the crypto bill, I was infuriated. Uh, and that 80, I told you that, you know, the 80, 80,000 likes on the tweet showed up because I think it tapped into that, that anger. That's the fuel of this crypto revolution. It's can we rebuild the financial infrastructure uh, and quite frankly, the whole infrastructure of the world in some way that is more transparent, more egalitarian, that doesn't rely on, you know, old people and their their giant egos, right? It's sheer narcissism to think in 89 that the world still needs your voice, right? What grace is, and I saw this, right? I'm on a board up at Harvard and the guy that runs the board has worked for five presidents, David, David Gergen. He's an amazing guy. At my first board meeting, he resigned. I'm like, dude. And he didn't resign. What he said is, you know, I'm resigning from the board, but I'll, I'll stay as an advisor. He said, at my age, you should advise, but not vote. And I thought there was something really brilliant about that, right? It's time to be wise counsel and to let the next generation make the decisions. And I think as a world and as a country, certainly in the U.S., we're at that point. Our politicians don't get it yet because they love power, right? Chuck Schumer loves being in charge. It's his time. Uh, the reality is, what crypto is saying is we don't care about you guys so much anymore. And the, the other reality is, though, you need politicians. Crypto won't work without, without buy-in from the, from the political structure. And so it's our job now. And I'm hiring people. I'm going to spend a lot more of my own time to educate Washington. Right? It drives me freaking crazy that progressives who should love crypto hate crypto. I'm like, what, you like the banks? Right? The average ATM fee in America is four and a half dollars. Who does that hurt? Oh, it hurts the poor people, right? There were $12 billion, I think, last year in overdraft payments. How many times have you bounced a check, right? Who bounced checks? Poor people. And so, like, the, the idiocy of not understanding, like, the banking system isn't good for the poor, and that being able to send you, you know, a Bitcoin for 12 cents, uh, no matter, you know, uh, to transfer money, you know, freely, to have a wallet for free in your is, is so progressive to cut out the, the middleman in music and in art is so progressive. It, it's a lack of education. It's lack of understanding. It's where Tom Cruise said there are less than four senators of the hundred that even know what a goddamn Bitcoin is. So you, you were working in finance back then. When was the point when you started kind of thinking like, okay, there's like something, you know, something should change about this or like something's broken here. And, you know, that then kind of like also triggered your interest when you heard about Bitcoin. They're like, okay, this, there is, you know, there's something interesting here. Well, so listen, I bought Bitcoin because it sounded like an interesting thing to do. It was a pretty simple thesis and I bought it as a speculative asset. I started learning more about it because I ended up in the newspaper in October of 2013. And next, the moment I was in the newspaper as the Bitcoin guy, I got invited nonstop to speak. And, you know, it's terrorizing standing in front of a whole bunch of smart people and not understanding your topic that well. And so it forced me to study and learn and talk to smart people. And I got it, but I didn't really get it until I walked into Joe Lubin's office at Consensus in probably 2015, late 2015. And... Consensus was maybe a month old. Ethereum was trading in the 90s, cents, not dollars. <laughs> but I saw, and Joe really did a great job of outlining this. Well, first I saw all these young people and old people plotting out this decentralized revolution, how they were going to disrupt not just the dollar, not just finance, but music, art, supply chains, and... You know, Joe's a, been a friend for a long time and he's, you know, patient. And so after like six sessions with him, I started getting it. But that was the point where I was like, shit, this is a revolution. This isn't just a speculative game. And so then I got more engaged 
Now, partly I got engaged because I bought a bunch of Ethereum. I didn't want Joe to be a lot richer than me. And I knew that might go way up. So I, I had to buy Ethereum to hedge. <laughs> and it started going up. And I hired a young, smart kid, John West. And the two of us, you know, dug in. And he actually lived over in their offices. And it was the early days, right? Vitalik and Vlad and those guys were, were all trying to figure out how the system would work. And I was still a little bit distant. Right. I was would call every once in a while. I'd go there once in a while, but I was getting my information through John West and you know through Joe every once in a while and trading it like I would trade. And then as I remember I gave a lecture at the first Ethereum conference. Ethereum was at 80. And there was this unbelievable energy around it. And I started meeting more and more interesting people. And that kind of sucked me in more. And so I started hiring people at my family office and, you know, and then I just, then the, then the, the wheel just kept rolling. And when we started Galaxy, I never thought I'd go back to work, uh, but I had like this idea, if I'm gonna go back to work, a few things have to be true. I need to be able to work with young people. Well, crypto is young people. I need to learn things. You know, I had been a great macro investor or a good macro investor. This was all about venture and I'd never been a venture investor. And so understanding the, the venture mindset, the venture process, uh, working with entrepreneurs. You know, as a macro guy, you never meet an entrepreneur. And as a venture guy, that's all you meet. And so I was fascinated. I loved it. Loved that part of it. And then the third part was, did I have something to offer to the community? And I thought, you know what? There's a lot of similarities between macro and crypto, right? Uh, it's it, Crypto is macro. I've seen a lot of repetitions. And so I think I have something to add on the trading side. And I originally thought I could be this bridge between the institutional world and the crypto world. I, I fundamentally thought then, and I fundamentally thought now, crypto won't reach its potential unless the institutional world buys in. And it won't be the exact same as the purest one, but we'll make lots of progress. And I think we're at that point right now where every institution is starting to buy in. I saw last week, both Walmart and Amazon put up, you know, help wanted signs for crypto experts. Think about that, the two biggest retail companies in the world say, all right, we give up, we're coming in. And so I don't think there's almost anyone left. Uh, why I told my staff this morning that I have never been as optimistic is there's complete buy-in now. And now it's about execution. It's about all of us putting our heads down as the computer scientists figuring out the riddles that will speed up the blockchains to make them work as effectively as they're gonna to need to be to process all the, the mountain of data that's gonna come at them. Uh, it's people understanding what decentralized versus not decentralized is, right? A, a Chinese blockchain is a pretty freaking scary thing. A decentralized blockchain is a pretty beautiful thing. Uh, and so what's decentralized enough? I mean, these are real questions that have to get answered uh, for this really to be the architecture that the world gets built on. Uh, but I know everyone's now engaged. And so that's really exciting. So on the on the Galaxy Digital website, you know, you said like oh, your mission is to like institutionalize the space. I'm curious if you can like expand a bit on that. Is that is that kind of what you alluded to now that you primarily see like traditional institutions like adopting crypto or like what else does institutionalizing the space mean? Yeah, it's, you know, First, we're going to change our mission statement, so stay tuned. <laughs> you know, listen, I, when I started Galaxy, the thought was, how can we help credentialize this? Right? I used to think of what Mike Milken did for uh, junk bonds, right? Jack Schulberg, even though it had a, a bad ending. Like, he really revolutionized finance, uh, revolutionized being able to, for companies that didn't have great balance sheets to be able to borrow money to set more risk. And what we take for granted today, he started. And I thought, wow, can we help, you know, credentialize crypto? Can we convince people that it's not wampum, that it's not Beanie Babies, that there's actually something here? Can we explain the technology to people? Can we use our own money to invest and learn, both make great wins and great mistakes, and then take those lessons and bring them to our client base, our investment banking clients, our sales and trading clients, our asset management clients. And that's still in, in, in the core of what we do, right? It's using our, 
our capital. Now we're adding, you know, we, we're merging with BitCo. We bought BitCo. We're going to be wallets and custody and building on shade. And uh, I took our whole team of, away about three weeks ago. And I was like, every single business is mandated to figure out how to put more and more stuff on chain. Like we can't just talk about crypto. We've got to be crypto. Uh, and so it'll be an amazing journey, I think. Uh, but that's really our, the core of what we're trying to do is learn this space and then teach people this space. You mentioned recently, um, I think in the context of the BitGo acquisition, um, that Galaxy Digital will start building things directly on chain. Can you talk about your plans there for a bit? So DeFi to start with, right, has been complicated for institutions, right? Can you trade on it without being in the regulatory doghouse? And so first, first thought was, how, how do we actually uh, get our regulators and ourselves comfortable that, you know, we know our customer? And so we're getting very close. Uh, we're actually started to uh, participate for the first time. Lots of other people participated and were like, "Yeah, hey, what are they going to do? You know, arrest me? And for the most part, that was a fair assessment if you're an individual. But if you're a regulated entity, you got to be pretty damn careful. Uh, and so I think what, what's going to make DeFi explode is solving this KYC issue, right? How, and there's lots of smart people, right? Stani and Ave is coming up with his version. Uh, Spring Labs is working on a version. Uh, we've got what we think is a pretty unique uh, approach. So, so the challenge here is basically like, okay, you want to use something like Uniswap and yeah. you don't like, there's no counterparty or like, yes. How do I know Kim Jong-il isn't on the other side of that? Right. Right. And so there is no government in the world that, and there's almost no rational person that says, you know, let's build something that really works good for the kitty porn purveyors or for the ransomware purveyors. Like ransomware is a terrible threat to the world. Every politician thinks so, rational people think so, right? Uh, kitty porn, not so good. Uh, financing, you know, terrorism, not so good. And so like, you're never gonna give, convince people that those are good things, right? And so you can try the one angle and say, well, that stuff happens in the other world too. That, that doesn't resonate with people. And so in order for crypto to thrive, to DeFi to thrive, right? Or peer to peer to thrive, there's gonna have to be some way that people get confidence that it's not being used for shitty things. Right? We hired the ex-head of the CIA, we being a consortium, uh, Mike Morrell, who did a report on just Bitcoin, who said Bitcoin's barely used for illicit things, much less than cash and much less than the legacy financial system. So that helped right, to calm people down that this is not all, you know, a bunch of crooks using Bitcoin, right? It's a tiny, tiny piece, but you're not going to convince the regulators to say, hey, go for it unless there's some way. And it, it, it's not going to necessarily be a perfect system, right? Uh, and, and so there are a lot of smart people working at it. There's going to be a system that isn't perfect for a crypto purist, but is pretty damn close for a practicalist and it's going to work. And I know I'm going to get criticized. People are going to say, ah, oh, the moment there's KYC, there's not DeFi. It's just not, you know, listen, you've got, you know, snarks and, and other ways to think about how, who gets, you know, how much information anyone needs to see to, to, you don't need to know, you know, your identity to know that you're a, a person that I should be able to trade with. So who will decide whether we should be able to trade with Brian or not? Governments already have that decision power, right? They just do. And so you're going to still operate within the realm of, in, 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 certainly in Western democracies, you're going to operate within the realm of the rules of Western democracies, or you're not going to operate. And that's like the reality of it, like the long arm of the law. If you want to, you want to, want to ask anybody, call Arthur Hayes, right? I love Arthur. And, you know, he moved offshore and the U.S. government got him because he broke the rules. At least they said he broke the rules. We'll see what, what the court decides. And so not just the US government, all these governments have a tremendous amount of power. And so working with them to create a system that continues to provide most of the benefits of crypto and retains privacy. Like privacy is a huge part of the American ethos, 
right? Like we're a company, a country about freedom. Uh, and so crypto is about freedom, right? Bitcoin is about freedom. Are we a, a country with 100% freedom? No, no country is, right? When you get together as a community, you by definition make concessions, right? I'm not allowed to kill you as a concession. I'm not allowed to, you know, have sex with animals. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a societal norm. Like, you know, there are concessions, right? We, and so there are going to be some concessions. And, and so the pure libertarians, I think, you know, I used to say I eat libertarians for lunch. It's a, it's a, it's a fantasy world. It's not, it's not reality. Well, cannibalism is also pretty frowned upon. So it's uh, not sure whether I would recommend yeah. it, but uh, <laughs> So Arthur and BitMEX, I mean, obviously BitMEX is not really DeFi, right? I mean, uh, uh, BitMEX is, is, is a centralized exchange. So basically, if you look at, if no, you look at DeFi and... But my point on Arthur in, 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 in BitMEX was, you know, the US said he, they thought he broke the rules, even though he was overseas, even though he was not living in the U.S. and dealing with mostly non-U.S. customers. And they said, no, 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 no. And they were able to reach out and get him. Oh, yeah, I totally see that. So, I mean, the U.S. authorities are very good at enforcing U.S. law abroad. I totally see that. But for DeFi, where there's conceivably actually an operatorless system, how do you see that linking in with KYC? Well, it's who uses it, right? So they can regulate who uses it. And so... They can't regulate, like, it's interesting. Why I think DeFi is going to explode is the moment regulators are comfortable with the KYC, there's nothing else to regulate and it's transparent, right? I think DeFi is going to work because it's a better system, right? It's got atomic settlement. It's composable, right? You can build on top of it. It's transparent, most likely. Uh, the single best part of it is it's transparent, right? You can, and so... I think regulators will end up loving it. They're just panicked about it right now, mostly because who's using it. And so they can pass a simple rule that if any institution uses it, you're in big trouble. If they say that, we won't use it. <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I don't want to go to jail and have my company shut down. The, the institutional part of the world still dominates where capital is, just dominates, it, right? Crypto is a tiny piece of the world. Right. It's two trillion dollars out of a four hundred trillion dollars of wealth. Uh, and so for us to grow, you need institutional buy in. If they wanted to go, they could if they if they really were panicked about it, they'd say, hey, it's illegal for individuals to use it. Oh, you could still do it. But then you're breaking the law. Most people don't like to break the law. I'm struggling a little bit with your argument, you know, because I've, I've, there's a bunch of reasons. Right. So first of all, you know, I think governments like control. Right. And guns like to be able to yeah, control their people. I think we're seeing that, you know, in, in of course, China is one extreme. But, you know, even in even in the Demo Western democracies. And if you see, for example, the COVID response, right, is very much around like uh, curtailing freedom as well. So I think there's that aspect. There is the aspect of, you know, you have this legacy in existing financial system which is so deeply ingrained in politics, has so much influence, regulations all around that. And, you know, that's massively threatened. And then you have fiat money, right? And the ability to print money, that's like, you know, one of the most valuable things probably that many governments have. So I'm struggling to see how they're just going to be, go ahead with all this DeFi stuff. And there's- well, uh, so, so let me, let me, the way I pitch it, and it actually resonates with people, is there's two different pieces to this. There's, they have a responsibility to be good stewards of our finances. And if they're not, uh, hard assets are gonna appreciate in value. If they continue to print money, real estate's gonna get more expensive every year. Bitcoin is a hard, hard asset. So Bitcoin really is a report card against how the central banks are doing. DeFi and blockchain itself is a, is a venture innovation. It is an efficiency gain. Uh, it's a transparency gain. And so most regulators don't wanna be anti-efficiency, don't wanna be anti-progress, right? Listen, the banks have a vested interest to fight this and they're gonna be using all their muscle to slow it down and stop it. 
I had a fascinating conversation. I was brought to one of the biggest banks and they had their hundred most senior executives for a day. And the guy who organized it said, we're really debating, do we fight DeFi or do we join it? <laughs> you know, like they were, they were literally having that debate. Should we use all our lobbying to slow it down or should we actually just throw ourselves in and figure out how does it help us? And so I'm not naive. I just think you can separate the fiat piece of this, right? It's why all the governments know they need a stable coin, right? Every single one now. I was on the phone with Brazil. They're all moving towards a central bank issued digital currency. The world's going digital. This is, you know, phones are going to be our wallets, not bank accounts. Uh, you're going to have a crypto wallet that has your Bitcoin and your, if you live in Brazil, your, your digital Rai and your opera tickets. And so I don't think any regulator wants to stand in the way of that progress or, in, or quite frankly, any politician uh, publicly. And so no one's going to give up the power to print money, the power to tax your own currency. Right. And so in some ways, Bitcoin is a threat to bad governments. And crypto really isn't. I, I'm sorry, blockchain really isn't. And all the other, you know, NFTs is an innovation. Now, if they were really intellectual, you'd say, well, fuck, NFTs is just money too. Like this is all money. What's, what, what crypto is doing so brilliantly is the exact opposite of what the internet did, right? If you think what the internet did was make all information broadly uh, free, right? I used to have to buy the Encyclopedia Botanica to figure out the that the GDP of Kenya was $95 billion. And now I pulled it up yesterday in eight seconds on Google. GDP of Kenya is $95 billion, right? In crypt, we're gonna be able to put value on, value on everything, everything that deserves value. So, so if, you, if you kind of like, let's say zoom, zoom out 50 years into the future, you know, and like historians look back at this time and they write about, okay, there was this crypto thing, Bitcoin thing that came along what do you think will end up being the impact, you know, like on a, on a large historical scale that crypto has on the world? That's a great question. I think there's two paths, right? So we go down a gradualist path, right? That's the way that history works until it breaks. So let's just think about the U.S. deficit for a second, right? What Janet Yellen and, and Jerome Powell and all the guys in DC are trying to do is run our economy hot enough that creates enough inflation, but not too much inflation to deflate away our debt slowly, which will slowly erode the value of your dollar, but not enough that it makes you panic, not enough that civil society breaks down. So that's their goal. Put that in bucket one. That can ha If that happens, crypto can, still do fine. Bitcoin will appreciate slowly. Uh, we won't replace the dollar as a payment currency. We'll still use the dollar. You'll have a digital dollar instead of, you know, using your credit card, you'll just, you know, shift dollars from one account to the X like, it, like we do with USDC. Uh, it'll be abroad. Uh, and we'll start trans, we'll, we'll start storing value in lots of other ways. Right? So that's kind of the base case that people in DC hope for. And in some ways we all need to hope for because the second case is inflation picks up much more severely than we think. Governments get nervous. Confidence breaks down in governments. They try to ban Bitcoin at one point there, right? We go through this, what an emerging market country looked like. I was in the center of the storm when Thailand went bust in 97 and the way their government reacted was one of a, Cage tiger, you know, slashing out at the speculators, trying to screw people, jamming interest rates up to a thousand percent and then to negative 500 percent to try to make traders lose money. In the long run, it was all for naught, right? They had terrible policy in their country, their currency went kaput. And so if we see that happen in the Western economies, Europe, Japan, US, you see a breakdown of the financial system, it's devastation. Then you would see a step function where it could get replaced by Bitcoin or some other version of what value is. Like, we don't want that. Uh, the amount of devastation that would cause amongst people's lives and fortunes. And, and the funny part is the guys who are wealthiest and are in the center always seem to be able to survive that, 
right? <laughs> you know, and it's the, the masses that get wiped out. Their whole savings get wiped out. And so I was on the phone yesterday in Kenya uh, with like 100 young kids. And I was like, Bitcoin specifically is important in the West. Crypto is important in the West. But in the developing world, in Kenya, in Venezuela, in Argentina, it should be seen as a human right. The ability to store your wealth in something that is kept at a global leisure should be a human right. Because think about these people in Afghanistan. Mark my words, within a, a day or two, they're going to freeze accounts and confiscate money. Right? And it's like, what? I just worked for 20 freaking years to, to make this bit of savings so I could send my kid to college and it's gone. And so when you talk to Wences Caceres about why he's so passionate about Bitcoin, it's because his family's fortune was wiped out twice with hyper hyperinflation, with big devaluations. And so we buy, I own a lot of Bitcoin, uh, Galaxy does, not hoping the U.S. has a hyper devaluation, hoping it has a slow devaluation, but knowing there's some optionality built in that the politicians really screw it up. And I think the speed of adoption of this is going to be somewhat targeted by how well the, the stewards of our economy do. Listen, the rest of it, NFTs, using blockchains for supply chains, that's going to be on the same adoption curve as the internet was. Right? Quite frankly, right now it's faster, but tech, better technologies always went out. I, I shouldn't say always, but often went out, and I think they will. But the the macroeconomic piece is going to be determined in a lot of ways by how well the people in charge do. Every single macro thinker, and I spent 30 years as a macro thinker I know, is really worried that we've left ourselves such a tiny landing space. You know, we talk about landing the plane. Well, it's easy to land a plane on a giant runway. They've left themselves a tiny runway to land the plane on. You know, Ray Dalio, who's one of the great macro thinkers, he told me, he doesn't see how the U.S. gets out of this without 15 years down the road, some kind of uh, debt restructuring. Think about it. the U.S. doing a debt restructuring like Argentina. It's unheard of, right? And so we'll see to be determined. Interesting. How do you think this is going to play out for the finance sector? So do you think all finance is, is going to become crypto based? Or will, will there still be, you know, two systems that run in parallel? Will they interconnect? No, I think it's going to take a while, right? This is transitions take a while. So first we need stable coins. Once you have stable coins, which are coming, then every one of the big banks is going to need to be able to trade them because you can't make so much money in currencies and not be able to trade your stable coins. And so then they all invest lots in the infrastructure of, you know, custody and security and blockchains and wallets and everything else where they buy companies and it slowly starts morphing in. There will always be a role for advisors, right? It's not like overnight I'm going to wave a wand and the whole population is going to be educated on how to think about investing, right? We don't want doctors to spend their entire life understanding what a yield curve is and why the shape of the yield curve should impact the price of equities, right? And so there will be plenty of room for specialists, for advisors, for people to say, hey, trust me on this. Right? That's broadly been what finance has always been about anyway. And so I think they'll have to morph how they deliver their services. And there'll be different banks that win and different banks that lose. But there'll still be a vibrant financial sector. Right. Artists can care less about investments. Most of the artists I've met, not all. Doctors, lawyers, military people, judges, right? We don't want the whole world to be investors. And so we'd like them to have a little more education on how the world works and how investing works. But there's going to be a big, big industry for people to give advice. And that's broadly what finance is. Maybe, maybe just speak a little bit more about Galaxy. Where do you see Galaxy Digital and like where do you want to take the company? I want us to be the marquee company uh, or one of the three marquee companies uh, in this space. I want us to, you know, I love our venture business. It is getting better by the week. I want us to continue to invest in the best product projects. Uh, we have an interactive business run by Richard Kim and Sam Engelbart that is just on fire right now, right? So 
if you want to learn about the metaverse, I, I have not met anyone better than Richard Kim uh, to really explain it and how it's happening so fast. So social tokens, generative art, that whole space of, you know, how we're monetizing community, how we're, we're this intersection of culture and, and currency. Um, and so that piece, I think, is going to continue to be a really important piece because that's the that's the the food for the rest of the, the machine. I want us to be the one stop shop for individuals, corporates, uh, institutions and corporates to come to and say, hey, help me with my crypto, you know, be the service provider, create my engine so it makes it easy for me or help me understand which cryptos to invest in. You know, so I, I want us to stay on the on the cutting edge. I want us to be a big asset management. We've crossed over two billion in assets under management. You know, I want that to be a hundred billion one day. And so let's bring in the the best people to help people both understand and manage this new asset class. You know, we're going to be close to five hundred people, I think, by March of next year. Once we could, you know, big go gets closed and we just figure, fill out the recs we have for hiring. Takes a while to digest that and to, to get it firing in all cylinders. But it, it's exciting to me because I literally think all the previous laps around the track, you know, when you go to a race, the cars run 10, 15 laps around the track and then they bring out the checkered flag to start the race. I think literally just last week, the checkered flag went down. When Walmart and, and Amazon said, we're looking, when the Congress said, oh God, uh, I think that was the checkered flag that the race is starting. Like the crypto revolution is starting now. All the rest of this stuff has been warm up. Uh, and so it's pretty exciting. And by the events last week, you're referring to um, the infrastructure bill, right? Yep. I don't think you can underestimate how important that was. And I know maybe from a non-US perspective, people are like, what, what, what the hell is he talking about? From the US perspective, where a tremendous amount of you know, global wealth resides and a tremendous amount of you know, crypto infrastructure, intellectual infrastructure resides. There was a wake up call in this country. Read the New York Times article. There was a wake up call in Washington that this is a real industry, that it's going to be here for a long time. It's going to help shape this country and it's not going away. That is what you should take from those 10 days. So do you think we will see, uh, you know, I mean, so far, right, maybe there's a few politicians that have been, you know, somewhat crypto friendly, but do you think we'll see a shift there that there's, you know, like uh, starts to be kind of like a widespread support for and also like a change in terms of regulations? So I would, I would tell you that most politicians were just are just crypto uneducated. And I think Every single person I've taken on the crypto journey all starts and all is like, wow, this is cool. Wow, this is interesting. Wow. None of them come back and like, oh, you're out of your mind, dude. Right? It's our, my job for the last nine years has been to bring people into the tent, to take people on the journey. And now there's an army of people doing that job. There was a small army when I started, like Dan Moorhead, Joe Lubin, those are my friends, uh, you know, Brock Pierce. I mean, Brock Pierce probably turned more people onto to Bitcoin than almost anyone I know, right? There was a lot of people doing it. Now there's armies. Morgan Stanley just put 4,000 salesmen on the job. And so we're, we've gone viral. And so I think it's important for people to understand when we take Congress and the Senate through this crypto journey, they're not going to come out and say, I hate it. They're going to come out mostly the same way most people do, the way Paul Jones and Stan Druckenmiller came out. And said, hey, unbelievably cool technology. Got to make sure we're using it the right way. Let me understand it more. And so they, they go down the rabbit hole, as the crypto people like to say. Most people, the great majority, come out optimistic. And so I think it'll go the same way. They just haven't taken the time at all. And that's what Ted Cruz was saying. He was like, how dare we try to regulate an industry and put people out of work when none of us even know what it is? And so it's our job as a community to help educate them. It's their job as our leaders to educate themselves. Yeah, Ted Cruz's speech was actually pretty interesting. How do you think the addendum to the infrastructure bill um, that basically posits that crypto should be used as a, as a way of footing 
part of the infrastructure bill that was going to be run up. How do you think that got there? So basically, who put oh, that there? Uh, because it kind I of- think Gary Gensler put it there. And Gary is my friend, and I'm not positive he did. Listen, it came from the White House. The White House is the Treasury Department, the SEC. They wanted to regulate crypto. It's not about tax. Listen, everyone thinks you should pay your fair share of tax. You can't not argue that in the US. You might argue tax rates are too high or we should have much lower tax rates, but it's it's uh, inconsistent to say, I shouldn't pay tax and he should, right? It's, it's, it's not fair. And so this was not about tax. I mean, if you think about, we've got a government spending $120 billion a month on treasuries. This was $25 billion over 10 years or two and a half billion dollars on a $1.9 trillion infrastructure bill. So it was a, you know, a, a fly on the elephant's ass. This was a way of them wanting to regulate crypto and they got caught. No one, I think in the institutional space, thinks that crypto is going to be completely unregulated, right? And in some ways, puts some light boundaries, but don't overregulate a young industry because we don't even know what it's going to be yet, <laughs> right? NFTs didn't exist in lots of ways in people's mind until about five months ago. And now it's one of the most dynamic, fast growing industries in the country uh, that's impacting sports and music and anything full of culture. And pretty soon you're going to see NFTs for healthcare. Uh, you know, and so you want to have light regulation to start with. And I think that philosophy is going to win out. The bill got through, it will get through the house. It will be a shitty law that doesn't start till 2023 and it will be fixed before that. And I think that's what the market believes. And I think that's what will be true. But so the, the bill still got through, right? At least in the Senate. Yeah. Yeah. Cause in some way, in some level, it's just so completely unenforceable and detached from anything. It, yeah. I mean, it shows you how little DC understood about what's happening here. So at, at this point, do you think there are major risks for crypto or like what can go wrong? Listen, there are always risks, right? Did we, uh, did we think China was going to literally ban crypto and throw mining out? Like we went from 60,000 to 29,000 in large part because the market got carried away a little bit. And then China said, oops, we don't like crypto anymore. Uh, I think the good news is crypto took a lot of stomach punches, right? You had China, you had regulators, you had all kinds of negative news and were higher. And so I'm really optimistic both on, on the price. Listen, trees don't grow to the moon. You don't have huge moves and then have another huge move and another huge move and another huge move. Like the law of large numbers catches up to you. And if you look at adoption, where ad crypto is being adopted really fast, market cap of the space has to kind of grow with adoption. And so, you know, people say, oh my God, we can get to a million Bitcoin next year. No, we can't. We can't. We can go higher, but we're not getting to a million Bitcoin next year. We might get to a million Bitcoin in seven years. Who knows? But we're not getting there next year. It, you just don't add a trillion dollars of market cap overnight. And so I think, like I said, I'm more optimistic today than I've ever been. A lot of shit can go wrong always, right? Can we get, can I be wrong on my assessment of government? Can you get bad legislation? Can you, like there's gonna be midterm elections coming up. My guess is the Republicans take some seats back and that actually just stops any, you know, regulation, which is probably a good thing, but I could be wrong on that. I, you know, what's interesting is I don't think a hack does it, but I can, I can come up with some terrible, like bizarre scenarios that would scare the shit out of people in crypto, right? I don't even talk about them because you don't want to throw them out there in the universe. Okay, what's, okay, <laughs> yeah. what's, the, what's the worst scenario you can come up <laughs> uh, I'm not putting it out there in the universe, but you can, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your, your bright mind can think of them. You know, it, it, people don't understand all them. It shocks me how many crypto wealthy guys walk around with bodyguards. I know 10 guys who, who walk around with bodyguards and I'm like, how, how, what, what are you talking about? Like, I'm a pretty well-known figure now. I'm on TV so goddamn much and you know, I don't have a bodyguard. Well, why do I have bodyguards? There's a fear that someone's gonna get them and kidnap them and put a gun to their head and give me your codes and you know, that no one will be able to find the money. And it, it, that's, it's not true to start with, it doesn't happen. And so, but you can see those fears play out. The same fears that have those guys walking around with bodyguards could play out on a much bigger scale. 
And that could scare the heck out of people. I also wouldn't be afraid if I were a wrestler. <laughs> That's true, too. Part of that is being a wrestler. <laughs> you always you always think you're tougher than you are, too. And then you run into something like, oops. Where do you think we're in the market cycle right now? I literally think we are, like I said, I think the the training laps just ended and the and the race is beginning to start. I, I think we're that early. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to go from 46 to 100 in the next month in Bitcoin. Or I mean, I, I'm looking at Luna, which is one of my favorite projects. Like I goes up every day. But I think we're at this acceleration of adoption. We can't hire people fast enough. And I know every one of my competitors is hiring just as fast. And so this is going to be a big industry in 24 months. I mean, think about it. Walmart and Amazon the same week said we're looking to hire senior people in, for crypto. That means they're going to explore at very least and most likely accept at least dollar stablecoin payments. And if you do dollar stablecoin payments, you might as well take everything else because you can just hook into someone like us and we can we can instantly trust, you know, shift your Bitcoin into into dollars or shift your Luna into into dollars or right. And so once you take one crypto payment, you take them all. Do you think when that's going to happen, the regulators will say, OK, KYC, and then you're good? Because to me, that seems unlikely. I think you'd be surprised. Like in lots of ways, crypto is a payment system, right? Stable coins is just a payment system. If we believe it's a better payment system, which I think it is, it's going to win out. Now the people are going to fight it. Isn't it telling that both MasterCard and Visa are big into crypto now? Right? How about this? It's a stupid idea. When Dan Moorhead and I first started talking about Bitcoin, we're like, oh my God, let's buy Bitcoin and short MasterCard and Visa. Like, it would have been one of the worst trades of all time. <laughs> you know, smart companies, you know, first of all, it, it, it took a long time for Bitcoin adoption and, you know, that never even dented MasterCard and Visa. And MasterCard and Visa, a couple of years ago, said, hey, the world's going to go to this new payment system and we're going to be part of it. And so, mark my words, if we have a crypto based payment system, MasterCard and Visa are not going to not be good companies, right? And so it's interesting. I think we're at this monster adoption phase. I don't know how fast, I'm not a good enough technologist to understand how fast these things happen. I can just tell you what I feel that we're in an acceleration phase right now. And so is it three years before like the world looks a little different or is it five? I mean, remember, you know, the internet bubble was 99 and we didn't get Facebook to like what, 05 or 06 and the iPhone about the same, like, Shit takes long to build well. Uh, we still don't have the Novi wallet. Like when Facebook opens their crypto wallet, which they're dying to do, and my hunch is they're now going to do it with USDC instead of their own coin, right? It's just a stable coin. They were only going to do a stable coin anyway, right? They originally were going to do their own currency, right? And then they switched to a stable coin or a series of stable coins. My guess is, this is just a guess, no inside insight. Uh, they end up using someone else's stablecoin because you don't make a whole lot of money in the stablecoin business anyway. You make it in the transaction business. And all of a sudden, two billion people with crypto wallets. Pretty freaking cool. So you mentioned, OK, this kind of acceleration at the moment. I think, you know, we all we can all see it and feel that in the crypto space. But like what we've had in the past, right? So there was like 2013, there was a big... Uh, bull market adoption and then there was this bear market you know and for a long time it was kind of depressed and you know not so much new people came in activity slowed down a similar thing happened in you know 2017 18 and then you know 19 20 again it was like slower like do you think these kind of cycles continue and like what do you think are the determinants yeah what i would tell you i would tell you is you've got to be very careful you should have two graphs. You should have a graph of the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum, which were cyclical. And you should have a graph of how many people are working in the industry. And you'll see how less cyclical it is, right? And so every once in a while, prices will jump ahead because of enthusiasm, because of macro forces. But what I'm telling you is it's been a pretty steady and it's accelerating the amount of people coming in. If you saw my analyst class, we just gave six 
offers to, you know, some of the analysts we had, summer analysts, one smarter than the next. These are the kind of guys that, you know, when I was in Goldman Sachs, we would die to hire. And so the human capital coming into this space every day is amazing. Like shove human capital into a space and they become productive. Our space is at the acceleration point. And so I, I don't think you're going to have this big cyclical move of, of innovation development, right? It's going one direction. It's just taking off, right? Now, we should make a bet. How long does it take for Walmart? They just posted their job offer to be part of the crypto community. <laughs> one year, two years, or three years, right? We know it's not three months. It's probably 18 months, two years. So the future is lined with all these forward adoption. Think about it. You're trying to decide. We have all this forward adoption that's coming, right? Very few, like a few insurance companies have bought Bitcoin, a very few, and they bought a tiny amount of it. But they proved that, hey, Bitcoin is a long duration asset in their mind, right? Someone sold it to them. Ross Stevens, give a heads up, uh, right? Great sales guy from New York Dig, a friend of mine and competitor. Like, why well, I don't even see my competitors as competitors. I think we're so early, we're all collaborators, right? We're all bringing people into this ecosystem. And so, again, it doesn't mean prices won't get carried away and Solana will go up and come down and go back up. And in the long run, I do think the projects that win will have the highest value. I've been getting killed on Twitter because I took some shots at, uh, I didn't even take some shots, I just don't really understand Cardano's appeal as the third largest crypto. I understand why it's, you know, there. Crypto communities are like British soccer fans. Right. They become so passionate about their thing that there's not even a rationality. Is that more to it. hooligan? <laughs> I think I I think in the long run, the real big market caps are going to be things that have the most usage. Right? Now, it doesn't mean I'm right about Cardano and maybe it replaces Ethereum. I don't think it will. Uh, or maybe Cardano becomes just another version of Bitcoin where it's a store of value for that community. I don't under, I don't know anyone in that community, which is weird because I know a lot of people in the crypto space, institutions, and I don't know people, but there is a community of Cardano. Would it be worth $80 billion if people didn't care? And I can tell you every time I tweet about it, I get attacked by 500, 1,000 people violently. You know? And so, we're in a weird world where value is being subscribed to things that make sense to some of us and not to others. And so again, it's impossible to predict exactly the, the rhythm of prices, but the rhythm of this industry is going one direction. Mike, um, you've been in finance a long time um, and a lot of the crypto folks are not finance native. So what do you think is the most important thing that people in crypto miss about how finance works? That's a good question, actually. So there's been a lot of growth in you know, the credit markets in, in uh, crypto, right? Companies like BlockFi and Celsius and hey, you can get, you can get yield for free. The one rule of, of finance is there's no free lunch, right? You're getting yield because you're taking credit risk in a counterparty that's unregulated, that's very leveraged. You might be fine, you might not be. And you won't learn that lesson until you get burned. And so I think there sometimes is an naivete that there's a free lunch out here. Uh, there isn't a free lunch. It feels like it right now because we're so early on and all this water's rushing into the pipe and the pipe's not that wide, so it's spitting out you know, really fast. But the rules of the universe still hold. Too much leverage will get you killed. Asset liability mismatch will get you killed. What is asset liability mismatch? When you borrow short and lend long. Those are the two biggest ways to go out of business and lose your head. And so kind of the rules there, it's not like a new set of rules that we've created, right? Euphoria and fear exist in traditional finance and will exist in, in crypto. And so in a lot of ways, it's a new weapon for investors. It's a new instrument, a new asset, but it's the same rules. So no free lunch in a, in a, in a way is very antithetical to the, you know, positive sum words that crypto people, you know, keep dreaming up, right? Well, well, listen, again, there is a positive side to this, right? 
how does value get created, right? Like why does gold, I always tell this story, you know, gold's worth $11 trillion and you could melt it all down, all the gold that's ever been found in the history of the world from Africa to Egypt, Asia, Africa, Asia, Egypt is in Africa. Uh, the Incas, the Aztecs, you know, my wife's jewelry collection. And it literally fits in a 50 foot by 50 foot cube, right? Uh, a 15 meter cube. That would be a sculpture in Central Park that would look very shiny. It'd be like, that's a $10 trillion sculpture. That's fucking ludicrous. Ludicrous, right? It has value because we invested it with value. Bitcoin has $900 billion of value because it's a social construct, because we say it has value. Picassos are worth $20 million because a small community of people say it has value. And so if we say it has value and now it has value because we say it has value and I trust that value because it's been there for a while, then I can borrow against it and I can lend against it and I can use it to, to do other things. That's where it's a hugely positive sum. We've created magic internet money in 13 years. That is awesome. Awesome, breathtaking, almost inconceivable. And it's why a lot of the early crypto guys sold. My God, this was a great run. It's really hard to hold. It's just hard because you're like, ah, what's happening is so awesome, right? It, you know, I give Joe Lubin credit. He never sells anything because he's had this unbelievably unshakable vision. I'm a trader. I'm a, I'm a macro guy. He was like, no, this is religion to him. This is going to be the way. And so... I remember when Ethereum was up at 1200, I was just begging him, sell some, just, and then it went all the way back to 90. <laughs> and he never said, God, I wish I'd listened to you. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's at what, 3000? Very few people do that. Most sell because it's hard to have the imagination that this could actually be happening. A trillion dollar asset. Bitcoin is probably the single greatest brand created ever. And no one owns it. One little girl once asked me if I was the CEO of Bitcoin. I was very proud because I had that Bitcoin goes to the moon song. She liked that song. And I was like, I had to tell her I really wasn't. I was just, you know, one part of a giant army. Michael Saylor, I'm sure people asked him if he was the CEO of Bitcoin. He's not either. Uh, there is no CEO of Bitcoin. Like there are hundreds of them, thousands of them. There's literally 130 million of them. That's a pretty cool experiment. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one last question before we wrap up. Like, what are the the questions that you're thinking about the most that, you know, like you feel like, oh, this is something I need to figure out to learn. Like, that's going to be important, but like, I don't understand it yet. You know, I literally go through that almost weekly. Uh, it was funny. I, I got asked to keynote Christie's big NFT art symposium. And I'm like, oh, God. And I do what I always do when I get asked. I call my two smartest people and the other three smartest people I know in the space. And I get them to tell me everything that they know. And then I kind of synthesize it. And I did a fine job and I was, you know, honored to be there and thrilled. And, you know, the other panelists were all far more seeped in NFT. You know, they built all the projects. And so it was a little embarrassing being the, the, the macro guy. But, but what was funny is three weeks later, I was like, wow, things have shifted so fast in three weeks. You know, the industries are moving so fast uh, that it's literally a monthly re-education to keep up. If you're going to try to be broad, if you're going to try to understand like, you know, what ringers are in the generative art world and why, you know, Alexei Cherniak is a, in some ways, an extension of, of uh, Saul DeWitt in the 1950s and why real art people are collecting generative art versus let's say avatar art, right? Like the kind of real art community is looking at the generative stuff as kind of an innovation on, on art, right? And the, the crypto punks are really being priced as collectibles, not as art. Like that, there's a, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm right on that even. That's my interpretation, but the nuance of trying to understand how this NFT world is working you know, gamified stuff versus non-gamified stuff. You could spend 24 hours a day just trying to keep up with NFTs. Then you got, okay, what the hell's happening in DeFi? Like, what's the level one battle? Like, why in God's name is Luna and Solana skyrocketing? Like, what's happening with Cardano, like Polkadot? Like, how in the hell is this whole level one thing going to fit together? I, 
I'm sure I got four guys on my floor is going to come in and explain it to me in the next you know, 24 hours, but it's complicated and it changes all the time. Uh, and so I think if you're going to be in this industry, it is an industry of a lot of homework. Luckily, so much is on the internet, like YouTube. I told these kids in Kenya yesterday, I was like, the lucky you have is there's unbelievable great stuff on YouTube and on Twitter, but you have to actually spend two hours a day, not just skimming it, but actually working and reading. And, you know, it's 56 years old and you got a lot of other stuff to do. That's a, it's not an easy task. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Mike. It was uh, great to have you on. And I'm excited to see where, you know, you'll take things next with Galaxy and in general in your journey in this wild new world. I certainly hope it's to the moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.